Hello, this is Jack Jackson back again with more looking at descriptive statistics, particularly graphical methods of measuring size. In the last video, we looked at bar graphs and histograms. We're going to look at another uh, type of graph that's very often used. It's called a circle graph or pie chart. I'm sure you've probably seen some of these before. And here's an example for the information about the party of the U.S. presidents. And you can see uh, a lot of information given in this particular graph. Each category has a circular sector or wedge of a of a circle, okay, like a, of the interior of the circle, like a slice of a pie. And the central angle and the area of the wedges are both proportional to the frequencies and to the relative frequencies of these different categories. The labels on here could either be frequencies, which is what we have here, 88 Republicans, 84 Democrats, or relative frequencies, 39% Republicans, 37% Democrats. Uh, usually, we, um, we're more likely to use percentages or relative frequencies with a circle graph because a circle graph or pie chart is mainly used to emphasize what portion of a whole that we have, which is basically what we have when we have print, uh, uh, percentages. Now, these graphs are actually pretty difficult to accurately make without technology. First of all, you need to find the, the, uh, the central angle, which is pretty easy. You just multiply the relative frequency times 360 degrees to get the degree measure of that central angle. But first of all, you need to be able to make an actual circle. So you need something like a compass to mark a center point, then make a circle. Then you need a, a um, protractor to measure the angles correctly. And then you can proceed on from there. They are difficult to read, so they, they must include some sort of data labels to make sense. Um, they, they can always be replaced by a histogram, which is easier to read. And it's especially easier to read if you have two or more categories that are close to the same size. So it's harder to see a difference in two different sizes of two wedges. It's a little bit easier to see the difference in the size of two bars. We could get, so we can always get the same information. So they can still be used effectively, but they should be used sparingly. And really, they should be only used in the following situations. First of all, they really should only be used for nominal data. Uh, if the data has an order to it, a bar graph in the right order is going to tell you a lot more information. And so that's going to be more interesting for you just to use. Uh, we're, if we're going to use a circle graph, we're really interested in determining the parts of the whole. So we're mainly interested in the percentages, the relative sizes. It's really good if, you're, if you want to demonstrate the relative size of one or two particular parts. For example, you can look at this and we can see that, hey, there's pretty close to the same number of uh, percentage of Republicans and Democrats and by far more Republicans and Democrats than any of the other parties. In fact, these other parties... Uh, we're, we're early on and they don't exist anymore. You also want to use this when the number of categories is pretty small. Usually about six or fewer, could go a little higher than that, but usually you want uh, a small number of parts. If you get too many wedges in there, it gets very messy. And you'd really like it to where it be where the relative sizes of the categories are pretty clearly different. One thing you, should, thing you should never do is use a three-dimensional circle graph because it drastically distorts information. Those are sometimes used. They look kind of cool, but they don't really work well at, at accurately uh, representing the information. I'll show you why in a, in a little bit. So here's uh, another one. We looked at this bar graph for this in our last video. Ages of baseball players on the Cardinals Little League team. This is made up. Here we have a legend off to the right by the color. 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, and here we have both the frequencies and relative frequencies. This works really nicely as a circle chart or pie graph because um, there are only three wedges. We can kind of see the relative sizes of the, of the groups if that's what we're interested in. 
Here's the same information about the parties of the presidents, U.S. presidents, a little bit bigger graph than we looked at for earlier. But here's the same thing information in a Prado style uh, histogram where we have a bar graph in decreasing order of frequency. So here you can see Republicans are the most with 88, 84 Democrats, 28 Democratic Republicans, 12 Federalists, and 8 Whigs. And what are we measuring here? Actually, this didn't really say. What this should say is, 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 is not actually the number of the presidents, it's the number of years in office is what these numbers are. Okay, so for example, you know, like these 84 years, quite a few of them were made up by by uh, Ro uh, President Roosevelt, FDR. He he was in office for a long time. Some of these are, you know, these eight years here, and the Whig Party is is all one person, um, and so forth. So uh, can kind of see uh, the number of years in office is one way to measure this, not the number of presidents. Okay. And that wasn't really clear over here in this graph. We should have, it, if, uh, it should have said that. Uh, it should have said something about that. Whereas, whereas it's a little bit more clear when we label the axis over here. Okay. So again, it could be represented either way. Uh, each does have certain advantages and disadvantages. The bar graph's easier to read. It's easier to tell the relative size of one bar to the next. Uh, but it's maybe a little bit easier to see what how that one bar compares to a total over here. An alternative way of doing it, I don't have a graph of one here, would be to stack these bars vertically. Maybe still keep the colors, but stack them uh, one on top of the other and, uh, and see how that works out. It, then it would be something very similar to this where you're doing a portion of the total. All right, let's, let's see if you can construct a circle graph. So to do this, you're going to need a protractor, a compass, a straight edge, and a pencil, perhaps even some colored pencils to make it pretty, and carefully construct a circle graph, or in other words, a pie chart for the data above. This is back to the same data we had before for grades. Okay, now remember I have the frequencies and relative frequencies worked out already. But what you need to do is find that what the measure of the central angle would be in degrees. And remember, the total all the way around is 360 degrees for a full circle. And work out what that central angle is, and then see if you can go ahead and make the graph. First of all, let's see if we can get all the central angles. So go ahead and, and work that out, and we'll check those before you proceed. Press pause now. Okay, now you should have worked these out. And of course, we can work out what these central angles are, which is just the uh, the one ninth times 360 is 40, and that's degrees. One eighteenth times 360 is 20 degrees, and so forth. And of course, these should all add up to 360 degrees. Hopefully, you got all those worked out. Now, I'll get your uh, drawing instruments out and actually make a circle graph on paper very carefully. Press pause now. Okay, well, you're back now. You should have done this, hopefully. And your graph should look something like this. You may have chosen different colors. They may be in different places, but here we have A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's. And we can see that. One, one thing we can see is that the C's make a big chunk at 44%. The A's, B's, and C's make up the vast majority of it. Only 17% left over here for D's and F's and so forth. Now one thing that's bad about this is it's it's not, um, since this is ordinal data, it would probably be better to put it in a bar graph. <coughs> okay, let's look at a different bar graph. Here's a bar graph that's a breakdown of medical expenses um, by category for a particular um, say a particular uh, office. So here are a few questions that you should be able to answer pretty easily from the graph itself. Uh, what is the single biggest category of expenses? What percentage of total expenses does this category compromise or comprise? And how much was spent on this particular category? 
See if you can work out the details on those. Press pause now. Okay, well the single biggest category we can clearly see is this, this part right here. That's one nice thing about this. As you can see that doctor's personal income of 56% is the biggest chunk. So that takes care of that. How much was spent? Well, it's 56% of the total. We need this total expense down here, 3 million whatever. And we can see that uh, it was about uh, $1,900,000. One so the doctors in this clinic, that's how much they were bringing in. Now, since the percentages are rounded to two decimal places here, they've been rounded off. We can multiply 0.56 times this total, which is probably accurate to the dollar because of the way they've listed it. That would give us $1,935,798. But we need to, we would, it would make more sense to round this off to two decimal or two significant digits because our weak link are these numbers up here. Had we had these percentages to more decimal places, then we could have been more confident about these things to more decimal places. All right, here's another example. Uh, not sure where the letter numbers went on that one. Um, let me see if I can fix this for you real fast. Okay, this is better. Now you can read this a little bit better here. Um, so I have some questions about this graph. See if you can read it and answer these questions. Uh, first, what level of data is measured here? Which day is the dealership closed? If you were a salesman working on commission, which day of the week would you choose to take off to maximize your income? Which day accounts for the most sales? And what percentage of sales occur on that day? So let's see if you can answer those questions. Press pause now. Okay, well, we can kind of clearly see some of this. First of all, notice we're measuring the day of the week and the amount of sales on those days. So the input is the day of the week, which is, which is ordinal, and the output is either dollars of sales or percentage of the total sales. But it's basically ordinal uh, input data. Which day is it closed? Let's see, we got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Looks like Sunday is the day it's closed. Which day is the biggest? Uh, well, it's these two are the big are the bigger slices. This one's the bigger one, 30%. So Saturday's the biggest uh, with 30%. Okay. Now Here's the same information on a pie chart that's 3D. Never use a 3D pie chart. Look at this. Look at how big this slice at 8% looks compared to this slice at 9%. 9% is actually bigger than the 8%, but it looks smaller in this particular graph. This 25% is smaller than 30, but it looks even even more pronounced smaller. In fact, the 25% barely looks bigger than the 17%. So it really distorts the uh, what's actually happening. You never want a graph to distort. Okay. In fact, this particular not only should you not use a 3D chart, uh, it would be better if you used a circle graph like this. But in fact, it would be better if you actually used a uh, histogram because this data is ordinal Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday there's an order there we might want to look at this and we can still get the same information that we need here and so we might say okay uh, we definitely if you took off you don't want to take off on Saturdays or Wednesdays because that accounts for over half of the sales just on those two days alone so you want to be sure you're at work those days um, you know, you can take off, it looks like everybody's taking off Sunday, uh, the dealership's closed, but if you get a second day of the week off, you'd be better off picking a Thursday, possibly a Friday, uh, because the sales are lowest. That is if you're working on a commission. Now, another type of graph you'll see sometimes is what's called a pictograph. 
Pictorial symbols are used to represent a quantity of the item. Uh, they're cute, so they're visually appealing, but they're harder to read than a bar graph. For example, here, each of the automobiles in the icons there represent actually three automobiles. And this one's better than most because it does have a vertical scale. I've seen that left off a lot of times. But the problem is, is when you get to these portions of a car, um, you know, with a little bit of thought, you can figure out that that's a third of a car and that's two thirds. But it's a little harder to, to measure that. So pictographs are, are uh, hard to read. Uh, and for that standpoint, they should really be avoided. Uh, instead, if you want to make it cute or appealing, do something else about it. Uh, you can make bars of different colors. You could fill this bar with little Toyota icons and this one with Ford icons, or you could put a, an automobile background or something. There's different ways you could make, make it visually appealing, but still make it easy to read. All right, so let's identify some problems with this particular bar graph. Okay, I want you to think about this a little bit and tell me what uh, needs to be fixed about this particular graph. Press pause now. Well, basically everything needs to be fixed about this graph. This is extreme, in fact it's, it's just so messed up, it's practically meaningless. First of all, I don't even know what I'm measuring. I have gooey bars and sticky snacks, and I have some numbers here. I don't know what these numbers mean. I don't know what we're measuring. So first, it needs to have some kind of title, like who knows what this is, but let's suppose it's calories per serving of these different snacks. That might be your title across the top. And then these then would be calories, and this would be type of snack. Okay, now with that, we're starting to get somewhere. But we still have some problems, and there's two or three problems here with, it, with the way the bars are done. First of all, notice that this bar here is twice as tall as this bar here. But it's also twice as wide and twice as deep, which means it indicates a volume of eight times as much. So if it's supposed to be twice as much, and yet it looks eight times as much, that's very deceiving. It looks like the sticky snacks is way, 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 way bigger than the gooey bars. Okay, so never use, you should never use 3D bars and even if you're using two-dimensional bars, make sure the bars have the same width. Finally, there's another thing that's deceiving, and that's that this vertical scale doesn't start at zero. Okay, so let's assume this GUI bars is 600, this is 700, and we're talking about calories per serving. See if you can correct all those flaws and make an appropriate graph now. Go ahead and do that on your own and come back and check it. Press pause now. Well, here is an accurate representation. It starts at zero. We have a consistent scale, zero, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, and so forth. We see our 500 calories per serving for gooey bars, our 700 calories per serving for the sticky snacks. We have a, ta uh, a uh, title up here, calories per serving. Here we have calories per serving on our scale here, and we have the type of snack here. Bars are the same width, so now the amount is actually proportional to the height of the bar and the area of the bar. And we still see that sticky snacks are definitely bigger than gooey bars, more calories per serving, but not, what did it look like earlier, eight times as much. Not even close, right? They're, they're a lot closer than that. Okay. So it's, I guess it's 40% uh, more rather than, you know, 800% more. Okay, so be careful that you don't, um, when you're making graphs, that you always make graphs that uh, start at zero, have bars the same width, and uh, are two-dimensional bars when you're doing bar graphs of any kind. If you see graphs out there that are not uh, done this way you should probably have them redrawn and they are just look at the numbers and not look at the graph itself because something has been distorted and probably someone's trying to manipulate you